Okay, so now what we're really interested in is what the IV curve looks like for a solar panel. And so this is what it looks like. This is actually the uh, IV curve that's generated by the IV swinger. Um, and <laughs> you notice that it's very similar to the IV curve for bench power supply. Um, and so sort of a flat top and a flat side, essentially a rectangle, but it curves because of it's, it's not, not ideal. So you don't have knobs, but if you did, basically the current knob is the amount of sun uh, or insulation, S-O-L. Um, and that's determined by things such as how clear the sky is, how much atmosphere the sun has to go through, the angle of the panel, the sun's rays, which depends on how you've placed it, where you are on the earth, the time of the day, time of year. And also um, the amount of sun is determined by how dirty the panel is. Um, so I didn't say shade because shade actually complicates things a lot if you've got like a uh, part of the panel that's, that's shaded. Uh, things get very interesting. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the voltage knob is pretty much, uh, <laughs> is, is more constant really than, than the, the current knob, which is the amount of sun that, that has a, a large effect on raising or lowering that whole curve. Uh, but for voltage, um, it's a little bit more fixed, but <laughs> temperature does affect the voltage. So if you get a higher temp temperature, you actually get a lower voltage. So that actually reduces the power, uh, which is a little bit counterintuitive to some people, but that is the case that a higher temperature panel reduces your power. So ironically, the more it's in the sun, the higher temperature it gets and actually the, the lower the power is. So the point where the curve hits the vertical axis is called the short circuit current, ISC. The point where the curve hits the horizontal axis is the open circuit voltage, VOC. And the point at the knee of the curve <coughs> is the maximum power point. And so I'm gonna go back to that drawing and show you those things. So this is the point here, which is short circuit current. It's called ISC. In this case, that's 8.13 amps. This point down here is the open circuit voltage. VOC, there's 32.83 volts here. And then this point is the maximum power point, which is 191.48 watts here. So the maximum power point is very important because that's what uh, tells us how much power the solar panel is capable of producing if it's loaded optimally. And so there are devices called maximum power point trackers that are built into inverters. So inverters are the boxes that convert the DC that a panel produces to AC, which is what comes out of our outlets. Um, so the maximum power point tracker constantly sort of searches for the maximum power point and adjusts the load that the panel sees to be as close to the resistance at the maximum power point as possible. Um, I'm not going to describe more about how they work. Uh, you can look that up and it's kind of complicated and interesting. So what can we learn from tracing an IV curve of a photovoltaic solar panel? So it allows you to see quantitatively and visually um, how the insulation, this the amount of sun affects the curve and the power. It lets you see uh, how temperature affects the curve and the power. Uh, and I mentioned shading before, so <clears throat> it lets you see the drastic effect that a small amount of shade has on the power. I'm not going to sh actually show that in this presentation. You either have already seen the demo uh, video or you may want to see that after this because I, I actually do uh, an, an example of, uh, of shading and show you what the curve looks like there. Um, and I also talked about how bypass diodes mitigate that effect of shade, uh, but don't, don't completely cure things. So before we talk about IV swinger, say, well, how do you do this manually? Um, so measuring the short circuit current, ISC, that's easy. So just uh, connect the cables together directly and then use a, an ammeter, which is a current meter, to measure the current. Uh, you may actually have to have the ammeter connected between the two cables, depending on which type of ammeter you have. So then the VOC, open circuit voltage, that's also easy. Just connect a voltmeter across the cables when they're not connected to anything, and the reading you get is the VOC. Then you've got to do all the other points in between. That's not as easy. So first thing you need is a variable resistance load. 
I'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, and then you start with very small resistance and measure the current through the load and the voltage across it. You record that, then you increment the load resistance, and you take the current and voltage measurements at each point until you have enough points to resolve the curve. So, what do you use for variable resistance? Well, typically when we think of a variable resistor, we think of a potentiometer, which is sometimes called a rheostat, especially when they're big. This is a single device that has a knob that you use to turn up or down the resistance. Uh, there are also devices called field effect transistors, FETs, and they've got two pins that the current will go between and the third pin, which controls, uh, which you can control with voltage, and that uh, will control how much current or basically how much resistance uh, that FET is, uh, is providing between the other two terminals. And the third possibility is a load bank. So it's multiple, you'll have multiple fixed value resistors that are in series, but then you have switches to choose whether each of those uh, resistors is bypassed or included in the chain. So you can sort of one by one increment how much resistance is uh, from end to end on that chain. But there's kind of a problem. Um, and that is that solar panels, modern ones at least, generate 250 watts or more. Um, and their short circuit current can be eight amps or higher. So this load that we're connecting across, it needs to do something with that energy. And the power uh, of the panel says how fast we need to do something with that energy. So by do something, I mean either do some work, emit some light, or emit some heat. Uh, so typical potentiometers and rheostats, FETs and discrete resistors are all too small to handle this much power and current. And so they'll literally burn up. Um, and a rheostat, um, you can get ones that are big enough to handle this, but they're very expensive, large, and heavy. And just a note I have here, if you're actually shopping for one, you got to look at the max current rating because the max power rating of a rheostat is only valid at its highest resistance. And if you're interested in um, the amount of current, like the ISC current going through it at its lowest resistance, um, that you better get one that's rated at that current. So an example of a large rheostat like this is the Ohmite RUS-10E, but it costs $800, it's 12 inches diameter, three inches thick, probably weighs 50 or 60 pounds or more, huge. Um, FETs that can handle this much power are expensive and need large heat sinks, and it's not trivial actually designing a <coughs> load, bank, load bank with FETs. Um, then fixed value resistors that can handle as much power are also very large and they're expensive and for a load bank you're going to need a lot of them. So one solution to this is to use light bulbs. Uh, in Gill's class at Stanford um, for the lab he uses a load bank that he built using 100 watt incandescent 12 volt DC light bulbs and switches and the current they can handle uh, I equals P over V, so that's 100 watts over 12 volts. That's 8.3 amps. That's pretty good. That's the max rated current. Resistance of each one of those is V squared over P. And so that's going to be 12 squared over 100, which is 1.44 ohms. It's also pretty good as far as uh, resolution of a graph. Light bulbs are cheap, which is good. And they can handle the power as long as the current is 8.3 amps or less. 1.44 ohms is reasonably good, as I mentioned. Uh, and the energy we can uh, is released partially as light, mostly as heat, but light bulbs are designed for that, so it works. So then the question comes, why automate this? We can do it manually, um, and it has been done manually for many years in Gill's class, uh, his lab, um, but automating it is much faster. So one advantage that gives you is that conditions actually can change pretty significantly in the time that it takes to swing one of these curves manually. Um, and obviously another thing is that it's possible to do many more experiments for the same amount of time. So more experiments, more learning, it's better. Um, so it also allows you just to get much better graphs because it uh, allows you to collect many more data points for 
a more complete curve, and it also removes human error, um, which is a, a source of, of ugliness in some of the, the manually generated graphs. So finally, the question is, why don't we just buy one? Uh, and so there are commercial IV curve tracers, but they're very expensive. So a uh, typical one is the Solometric PDA 1000S, and current price for that is about $5,700. Uh, and one of the reasons they're expensive is they've got things we don't need in a sort of lab situation like this. They're, um, one thing is they're designed to be able to measure IV curves for whole strings of panels. Um, we only need to do it for a single panel at a time. They are designed to be small, handheld, so you can carry them up and on, under a roof on your belt or something like that. And they've got lots of bells and whistles. So uh, the IV swinger, the materials cost that were about $300. So you can see it's like far, far less expensive. So that's the end of this video. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you haven't seen the other videos for IV swinger, just search for IV swinger on YouTube. And thank you very much.